let's try to figure out the energy of this system. By the way, technically speaking, it's not objects that have energies, but the whole system. So we talk about the energy of these two charges together. So how would we go about, and let's say these are two point charges, so how would we go about figuring out the energy that's stored in this system? Um, you plug those down and then turn the two, so uh, positive two, k times positive two times three. Positive two. Now we have to put things into standard units. Which one? Two times ten to the negative six. That's right. If you look up in the inside, your inside front cover, you'll see that mu means ten to the negative six. So two microcoulombs is two times ten to the negative six. This will come up a lot in the homework as well because a, a regular coulomb is too big to be useful to work with. So we're usually going to work with microcoulombs. So it'd be two times ten to the negative six times. Good. Um, over four. This is already in standard units. And now we don't square this. We know that it's so important to remember to square the distance when we're working with force and field. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to square it for energy. Uh, we have to plug in for k as well. So let's look that up if we need to. Or do you remember what k is? I think it was 9 times 10 to the 9. Good. OK, so let's do that calculation. So for this formula, we do plug in the signs. So this came out to be negative. Now we have to ask ourselves how we can interpret this. Well, remember that the zero point here was when these had an infinite separation from each other. Um, so when are these particles happier? When they're in an infinite separation or when they're closer to each other? Um, infinite separation. Well, let's see. So when they're in an infinite separation, R would, uh, U would be zero, right? Yeah. And when they're closer to each other, they have a negative energy. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, do they like or dislike having the negative energy? Like yeah. As we were seeing, everything wants to move its energy to the left on the number line. Yeah. So this is actually good. Yeah. Um, uh, the further to the left you are on the number line, the smaller your energy is. All right, so these must prefer being close to each other rather than being infinite. And that's what we would have predicted anyway, because they're unlike charges. We already know that unlike charges want to get close to each other. So it's no surprise that they're happier when they're close to each other than they would have been at infinity. So if your energy comes out negative, that means the particles are happier when they're close than, what the, than when they're infinitely separated. And if the energy comes out positive, that means that the particles uh, would be happier at an infinite separation. Well, you can see this is going to come out negative when these two signs are different, which makes sense because that's when they want to get close to each other. Mm -hmm. And this is going to come out positive when these two signs are the same, which makes sense because that's when they repel each other and want to get far apart. So you could also just figure out the sign based on common sense. Okay. Now, how would we interpret this over here? Well, it didn't, uh, if these particles started at infinity, it wouldn't actually take work to move them over here because they want to move over here. Mm -hmm. But instead, we could say, ask ourselves, how fast are these particles moving by the time they get to a four meter separation? So the question might be, if the two particles start uh, at infinity and then they start moving towards each other, how fast will they be moving when they're at four meter separation? Well, what extra steps do we have to do now to, to calculate that? Um, we would have to find what the total kinetic energy 
Yeah. I guess the best, best way to deal with that is, suppose that you start with Q1 over here. Let's say this starts, at, this starts here and is at rest. And let's say that Q2 is starting at infinity and then moving over here. It's simpler if only one of the particles is moving. So if one of them is at rest and the other one is moving from infinity to here, um, well, how much kinetic energy would this particle have by the time it gets to this point? Right, actually positive. positive. Remember, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's losing this much potential energy, so it must be gaining that much, kinet much kinetic energy. Right. Kinetic energy is always positive. So since it's losing that much potential energy, that would all go into kinetic energy. So we could plug in 0 0.0135 for the kinetic energy, and if I told you the mass, then you could then figure out the volumes, mm -hmm. I mean the velocity. So again, this is a common type of problem on the homework on the exams figuring out how fast particles are moving uh, by the time they get to a certain point. So you have to think to use energy to solve that type of problem. Energy is a good strategy for problems that are about velocity because kinetic energy is about velocity. On the other hand, suppose that the particles start over here and I want to know how much work it will take to move this particle an infinite distance away. Well, if the particle started here, how much work would it take to move it an infinite dis to move it out to infinity? Um, positive 0.0135 joules. Yeah, that would take 0.0135 joules. And if the sign is confusing to you, you can just use common sense. We know it would take positive work because um, the particle doesn't want to move out this way. You got you have to do positive work because it doesn't want to move away from this particle over here. Yeah. So this explains why it's useful to know what the potential energy. Here's another typical type of problem. Let's try to figure out the energy of this system. We want to figure out the total energy um, of this system. Well, it turns out that um, the, we know that the energy of the Q1, Q2 system would be given by this formula. But we also have to figure out the energy from the Q1, Q3 interaction. And we have to figure out the energy of the Q2, Q3 interaction. So this might not be obvious, but if you want to find the energy of a system of multiple particles, then you have to plug in every possible pairwise pairing over here. Mm -hmm. So we have to do the, uh, the pairing of 1 and 2, 1 and 3, and 2 and 3. OK. Um, so, uh, so let's see what we would plug in for that. So that would be 9 times 10 to the 9th. All right, so what could we start with plugging in? If we just did this, this would just give us the energy that's stored uh, between Q1 and Q2. But we also need to know the energy that's stored between Q1 and Q3. And we also need to know the energy that's stored between Q2 and Q3. And that's the, those are all the pairings yeah. right there. Those are all the possible pairings. Okay. So we'll have to do each of these. So this would be 9 times 10 to the 9th times what? Times uh, positive 3 times 10 to the negative 6. Mm -hmm. Times uh, negative 4 times 10 to the negative 6. Good. Over, um, over 14. 
How'd you get that 14? I'm sorry. Um, or 12. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> from here to here is 5, and from here to here is 7. Okay. And we don't square that, because this is energy, not force. Yeah. 